My name is Dennis Speed, and on behalf of the Schiller Institute, I want to welcome everybody to today's celebrating Schiller's birthday and the fall of the Berlin Wall. In just a moment, we're going to uh, hear a message of greetings to this conference and the keynote speech, which will be given by the founder of the Schiller Institute. We just want to briefly introduce that. 30 years ago today, November 9th, 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. On October 12th of 1988, one year earlier, uh, Lyndon LaRouche, the husband and co-founder of the Schiller Institute, uh, husband of uh, Helga Sepp LaRouche, gave a speech in Germany, in Berlin, at the Kempinski Hotel. And he said on that occasion that the time had come for the reunification of Germany with Berlin as its capital. Uh, that speech was also uh, broadcast in America on American television at that time when Mr. LaBruche was running as a candidate for the United States presidency. Absolutely no one agreed with him. But that didn't stop the Berlin Wall from coming down, and it didn't stop the unification of Germany one year later. So the NSA did not know, the CIA did not know, the Pentagon did not know, no one at any political science department in any university in America knew. Henry Kissinger did not know. Zbigniew Brzezinski, Samuel Huntington, none of them knew. None of the recognized, acknowledged authorities knew. And it was precisely because they were the accepted, acknowledged authorities that they could not have known. It was only the unacknowledged authorities, in this case, Lyndon LaRouche, who articulated what was to be. He articulated the future in the then present, and he defied the axioms of all of the authorities. Now, the poet Percy Shelley said, poets, according to the circumstances of the age and nation in which they appear, were called in the earlier epochs of the world legislators or prophets. A poet essentially comprises and unites both these characters, for he not only beholds intensely the present as it is and discovers those laws according to which present things ought to be ordered, but he beholds the future in the present. He went on to say, ethical science arranges the elements which poetry has created and it propounds schemes and proposes examples of civil and domestic life. Nor is it for want of admirable doctrines that men hate and despise and censure and deceive and subjugate one another, but poetry acts in another and diviner manner. It awakens and enlarges the mind itself by rendering the mind the receptacle of a, the receptacle of a thousand unapprehended combinations of thought. That's the realm in which the Schiller Institute presides, or abides, excuse me, uh, and that was the, in, uh, the inspiration that Helga Sepp LaRouche had for its creation. It was first uh, conceived of in 1983, was created in 1984, uh, and now what we're going to do is hear uh, the presentation for today uh, by video uh, prepared for this occasion and other occasions around the world uh, by Helga Sepp LaRouche. We celebrate today a threefold anniversary, that of the 30-year anniversary of the fall of the world in Berlin, the 260th birthday of Friedrich Schiller, the great German poet of freedom, and it is 35 years ago that the Schiller Institute was founded. And when you have a coincidence of such three anniversaries, it is actually worth looking back and see how they were interconnected. Now, many people today may not even remember the fall of the wall because they were either not yet born or they were too young to follow it. But it was really important to learn the lesson of what happened then and what went wrong as compared to the situation we have today. Now, I remember many of the incidents as if it would have been yesterday because we were not just standing on the sidelines and, and watching it, but we were in the middle of these events trying to shape them with our ideas. 
Now, there is almost no example of a greater difference between the official narrative of what happened with the German unification and the fall of the wall. The official narrative is one thing, and what really happened is quite a different thing. Because if you listen to the official narrative, then this was the victory of democracy over communism, of freedom, over dictatorship. And Fukuyama, the historian, two years later, when the Soviet Union collapsed, even said, this is the end of history. And in general, the narrative was that the entire world would embrace the Western model of democracy, of human rights, of the parliamentarian system, and that would be just the way it would go. I, however, in many speeches in 1990, warned that if you would superimpose over the collapsed communist economic system an equally bankrupt Western liberal model that you may experience for a certain period of time a boom, but then eventually it would come to a much, much larger collapse of the entire system. And I think that's exactly where we are today. If you look at the world around the globe, you have a system in complete disarray. Look at the mass demonstrations in Chile, in Iraq, in Lebanon. Look at the yellow vests in France. Look at what happened with the Brexit. The German farmers are in a total revolt. Now, this is actually, in my view, the first time in history that it happens at every corner of the world at the same time. And I think what Leibniz said at the end of the 17th century is really true today. He said, if the whole world at some point would be dominated by utilitarianism, it would come to a world revolution. Now, <clears throat> the attempt by the Western establishment in 89, and especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91, to impose an unipolar world, which was this only de democracy idea, obviously has completely backfired. Uh, they try to impose this unipolar world with regime change, with color revolution, with interventionist wars. And the idea of history, basically up to that point, was essentially the idea that you only would talk about the history of the Atlantic sector. But the backlash against that effort to impose the unipolar world has led to the emergence of a whole bunch of different nations, of Russia, the, of China, of India, uh, of other Asian nations. It has led to a completely different self-understanding in Africa. It has increased the gap between the rich and the poor in such a way that this is not sustainable right now anymore. The middle class is disappearing. So. If you look at this and ask yourself, how did we come to the point of the so-called end of uh, history, democracy everywhere, and this gigantic upheaval which we see right now? Now, 89 was what you could correctly call Sternstunde der Menschheit in German, which means like an extraordinary chance in history, a star hour of, of humanity. And it was one of these great moments where one could actually shape the history because communism had disappeared and you could have imposed a, a, a peace order for the 21st century. And we had that vision. Lyndon LaRouche already in 84, when the Soviet Union rejected his offer of the SDI after President Reagan had made that the official American policy, predicted that if the Soviet Union would keep their policies of then, which was one of efforts of military domination, of uh, uh, primitive accumulation against their own economy, that the Soviet Union would collapse in five years. And so it did. Lyndon LaRouche also, watching the economic difficulties of the Comic-Con countries, in 1988, <clears throat> predicted that there would be soon the German unification and that the United Germany should develop Poland with Western technologies as a model to transform the entire Comic-Con. 
Now, <clears throat> when the wall fell, actually, after the increasing Monday demonstrations, we were actually the only ones who had a conception. Well, remember the incredible joy. People were dancing on the Berlin Wall when it was opened. And, you know, it was an unbelievable moment of, of po potential change in history. Now, the official documents of the German government uh, admitted, they were published a couple of years later, that despite the fact that German unification was the primary uh, goal of German politics, they had no contingency plan. They really did not believe it would ever happen. Nobody believed the Soviet Union would really vanish. But we had this idea, which Mr. LaRouche had proposed the first time in 1988, that the unified Germany should develop Poland. And I wrote a leaflet which was published in the mid of November 89, Beloved Germany, continue with confidence. And I proposed exactly that, that, you know, with Western technology, we should develop Poland and the other Comic-Con countries. Now, uh, <clears throat> this was naturally, uh, you know, not yet becoming policy, but Kohl, the chancellor of Germany at that point, made a first baby step in the direction of uh, sovereignty by publishing in on the 28th of November, a few days after my leaflet, a 10-point program, which was not yet the idea of a unification, but of a confederation of the two German states. Now, <clears throat> two days after that, on the 30th of November, Her Alfred Herrhausen, the head of Deutsche Bank at that time, was assassinated by a very uh, dubious third generation of the Red Army faction, a terrorist organization, which probably never existed. I mean, that's at least uh, a question still to be investigated by the historians. But it was a message to call, do not dare to go in this direction of sovereignty of Germany. At that point, you had a fierce reaction. Margaret Thatcher launched this, the Fourth Reich campaign uh, Mitterrand demanded uh, that Germany should give up the D-Mark and adopt the Euro. Uh, <clears throat> Bush uh, Senior uh, demanded self-containment of Germany through integration into NATO or further integration into NATO and the EU, the acceptance of the Maastricht Treaty, and with that the austerity regime, which is now leading to the detonation of the EU, the tensions between East and West and North and South. Now, we proposed the productive triangle, Paris, Berlin, uh, Vienna, which was the idea to use Western technology to transform the countries of Eastern Europe and basically use their productive potentials to modernize and integrate with Europe. Now, the first such proposal we published in January 1990. And when the Soviet Union collapsed in 91, we immediately prolonged that productive triangle idea to all of Eurasia to connect the productive centers of Europe and the population centers with those of Air, uh, Asia through development corridors. And we called it the Eurasian land bridge, the new Silk Road. This was also meant to be a peace order for the 21st century. Now, naturally, the neocons uh, who wanted to impose their unipolar world broke their promises they had made to Gorbachev that NATO would never be expanded to the uh, borders of the Soviet Union. In 91, according to a German newspaper, <clears throat> the CIA published a report that the that Russia had a better educated uh, workforce and more natural resources than the United States. And therefore, if one would allow economic development, they would become a competitor on the world market. So therefore, economic development should be discouraged. Now, what went into effect was the shock therapy of Jeffrey Sachs, the same Jeffrey Sachs who is now in the middle of the uh, green climate financing scam. Now, Soros, George Soros was involved in a huge brain drain of uh, Russia and the other uh, uh, former uh, Soviet uh, countries. And in Germany, 
uh, they really tried to squash the potential of a German uh, relationship uh, to Russia at that point. On the 8th of March in 1990, <clears throat> there was the last people chamber of the GDR. Uh, they created uh, the Treuhand Anstalt, which was the largest, uh, what became the largest industrial holding uh, of the world. And they were supposed to protect the state-owned property of the GDR. But a cold coup was made. Already on the 26th of June in 1990, uh, the Demaisier government uh, published statutes which only talked about the, quote, privatization and reorganization of the state-owned uh, industries. In 1990, in August, Detlef Karsten Rohwedder, uh, who was a very uh, good and effective uh, <clears throat> industrialist was assigned to reorganize uh, this uh, Treuhand. And he had an excellent understanding of the requirements of the real economy. So he put restoration before privatization with the primary aim to protect the jobs of the state, previously state-owned uh, companies. He immediately was viciously attacked by British and US investment banks who accused him that he would block foreign investment. He was shot on the 1st of April 1991 uh, by the same dubious, probably never existing third generation of the uh, Red Army faction, the terrorist Bader Meinhof crew. He was replaced by Birgit Breuel, the daughter of Alvin Münchmeier, whose bank had a very dark history being one of the key financiers of the NSDAP in the 30s, <clears throat> uh, together with uh, Harriman in the United States and Montague Norman, uh, the governor of the Bank of England. Now, what happened was a gigantic expropriation of the property of the population of the GDR. All of a sudden, the life work of all the people of the GDR meant nothing. It was declared worthless. And this is a shock uh, from which these people in East Germany have not recovered to the pres present day. And I would say that this expropriation had a lot to do with the fact that you have now the emergence of the alternative for Germany uh, a populist organization, which, however, has a lot of very evil elements, right-wing extremist, if not worse, fascist elements uh, in it. Now, the establishment uh, went to basically use the fact that communism had disappeared, and something new happened. When the Soviet Union still existed, the oligarchy in the West still saw a certain requirement for scientific and technological progress to basically keep up with the arms race in the Cold War for reasons which were already developed by Machiavelli, that you always have to stay on the same level of technology or be ahead as your opponent. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the forces of the British Empire went into an absolutely unrestrained deregulation of the financial markets. And they went back to the old oligarchical thinking to reduce the population, keep the population uh, backward. And especially after they succeeded to eliminate Klaus Stiegel in 1999, uh, you had a complete unrestrained deregulation of the financial markets at the expense of industry, at the expense of the common good for the total profit maximization of the speculators. Now, in 2007, in July, when the secondary mortgage crisis erupted, actually one week before, Lyndon LaRouche made a world famous video where he said, this system is absolutely finished and all we will see now is how the different aspects come to the surface. And then you had, as a result, that people did not listen to him, the big systemic crash in 2008. Now, Nothing was done by the central banks to eliminate the root causes of that crash. And therefore now, uh, <clears throat> about you know, 11, 12 years later, we are facing 
uh, an even worse crisis because all they did was quantitative easing, zero interest rate, negative interest rate. And today uh, you are looking at the blowout of the entire system much, much worse than 2008. But in the meantime, another tendency also developed. Our proposal for the Eurasian Land Bridge, uh, we organized conferences and seminars in five continents. Uh, in 96, uh, there was a big conference in Beijing where I presented our proposal to use the Eurasian Land Bridge as a cornerstone for a new world economic order. And at that point, China declared the Eurasian Land Bridge to be the strategic goal of China until the year 2010. But then naturally in 97, the Asia crisis happened in 98, the Russia state bankruptcy. And basically these countries, Asia, the Asian countries were forced to develop an alternative to defend themselves. And since then a whole array of organization has developed the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Global South, and you know, the Schiller Institute just continued to make many conferences proposing that the uh, Eurasian land bridge should become the world land bridge connecting all five continents. Then in 2013, President Xi Jinping announced the new Silk Road in Kazakhstan. And in the six years since, this has become the largest infrastructure project in history ever. It already is joined by 157 nations and 30 large international organizations. They have created a new paradigm based on respect for the sovereignty and non-interference in the social system of the other countries. Uh, it is now <clears throat> basically a model of cooperation, which according to President Xi Jinping, is open for cooperation for every nation on this planet. Now, when you look around the globe, uh, you see demonstrations in many countries, many of them larger than the Monday demonstrations in the GDR in 89. And some of them are not as peaceful as those were. We are also confronted with existential dangers, uh, especially emanating from the drug cartels. If you look at the situation in Mexico, or if you look at the mostly Soros-sponsored uh, color revolutions like Hong Kong and other destabilizations around the world. It is actually uh, also the same forces which are behind the coup against President Trump since 2016. But there is also a counter move. The criminal investigation of the coup plotters against Trump uh, led by Attorney General uh, Barr. So 30 years after the fall of the wall, we are exactly at the point which I had said in many speeches that if you superimpose the liberal system, then you will, lead, will have a much larger collapse. And that is exactly what we see today. But we also have the new constellation of the Belt and Road Initiative and President Trump, who said many times and has proven through his action that he wants to improve the relations with Russia and China. So you actually can say that we are experiencing right now the great chance of 2019. But what must occur to learn the lesson of what was going wrong 30 years ago the four powers, the United States, Russia, China, and India, must impose the prescriptions of Lyndon LaRouche. We must have a global class deagle separation of the banks. The casino economy has to end. And this should occur before the collapse is really throwing the world into chaos. Then we need a national bank in every country on the conceptions of Alexander Hamilton. We need a new Bretton Woods, a new credit system to finance international projects of the Belt and Road Initiative. And we have to have an increase 
of the productivity of the economies through a joint crash program for the realization of fusion power. And we need international cooperation for space uh, exploration and research. Now, all these countries, the four powers joined by others, must join hands for the economic reconstruction of Southwest Asia, which has been destroyed by these interventionist wars. And we need the industrialization of Africa, because this is the big challenge of the entire humanity. We must overcome geopolitics, and we must agree to what President Xi Jinping has been <clears throat> proposing for many years, a shared community of the future of the one humanity. This, however, must be combined with the renaissance of classical culture. And this is why the role of the Schiller Institute and the ideas of Friedrich Schiller are so absolutely indispensable. It was the principle of the Schiller Institute when it was founded in 1984 that a new world economic order could really only succeed if you combine it with a classical renaissance. We need a dialogue of the best traditions of all cultures. And <clears throat> for European civilization, this means that the beautiful image of man as expressed by Friedrich Schiller and as it was celebrated by Beethoven in the Ode to Joy in the Ninth Symphony, must become the basis of our education system and of our social life. Because according to Schiller, each human being has the potential of becoming a beautiful soul. And his definition of that is the potential for every human being to become a genius. He has an idea that every human being has a limitless capacity for self-improvement intellectually and morally. <clears throat> so the liberal model, if you look at it, has not just failed economically, but also culturally. If you look at the drug epidemic epidemics, for example, in the United States, the ugliness of the youth culture, the uh, violence in the so-called entertainment, the school shootings and similar things, it is very, very clear if the West wants to survive, we need an aesthetical education. President Xi Jinping has said in many speeches how important he regards the aesthetical education because it leads to a beautiful mind and a beautiful soul. And it is the source of the creation of great arts uh, art, works of art. Now, in the United States and Europe, <clears throat> we must recreate the best traditions of humanism and classical art in the tradition of the Italian Renaissance, the German classics, the music of Bach, Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, Verdi, and others. This is not an option. This is a necessity. Civilizations have disappeared. And if you go to the museums, they are full of examples of nations, of cultures, of civilizations, which were morally too deprived to make it. Now, Europe and the United States could disappear. And I'm not saying this as a pessimistic prognosis, but as an incentive for us to change our habits and assumptions. We have to recreate our civilization based on the lofty ideas of great poets like Schiller, whose 260th birthday we celebrate today. Thank you. On October 6, 1989, Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev arrived in East Germany for the 40th anniversary of the German Democratic Republic, which had by that time lost tens of thousands of its people, 
through gaps opening in the Iron Curtain. What had begun as Monday night candlelit vigils in Leipzig grew to include thousands of demonstrators across East Germany, filling the streets, demanding their freedom and the right to travel west. These demonstrations only grew stronger, and the people were no longer afraid to demand access to those inalienable rights of man that were still enjoyed by the West. Even though the Western system was crumbling under controlled disintegration, and the political leadership had become increasingly corrupt, elements of the West still maintained their constitutional commitment to human liberty. But after years of enduring the Soviet system, the people recognized that they no longer had to accept the conditions of that system, and they desired to be united with the West. In previous times, as with the revolts that took place in Hungary and Poland, the KGB and the military were brought in to round up resistance leaders, who in some cases were never seen again. Now, all eyes were on East Germany, the sole barrier between the West and the East, which was in complete upheaval. Would the Soviet military be brought in again to crush these demonstrations? Would the people end communism from the streets of Germany? Would this be the cause for another Berlin crisis? In the midst of this great uprising, a GDR minister announced that there would be new travel guidelines. The message was immediately misinterpreted and taken to mean that the borders to the west were now open. The border guards opened the wall and stepped down. I think you all have seen in recent days these extremely exciting moving pictures from Berlin. You know that the borders between East and West Germany have been opened. And the wall in Berlin, while it is still there, has practically come down. When this happened on the joyful 9th of November, in the first evening, 100,000 people immediately came over from East Berlin to West Berlin to taste what the new freedom would look like. Sunday, three million people uh, came and the stream has not ended since. Well, so also into West Germany, people came, they uh, embraced each other and, you know, the people were so happy and the West German people, they overcame all normal kind of behavior that has showed a tremendous hospitality. They opened champagne, uh, they gave food, they invited people for dinner. People were climbing the wall from both sides. Uh, the ode to joy, the symbol of the fight for freedom, was sang on the most important street in Berlin, the Kudam. And the uh, symphony, symphony of West Berlin played for free the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, and they performed two times the magic flute. Well, let me tell you, I think this is a genuine, real revolution. It's a revolution of agape, of love, of charity, not a revolution of rage. And as one woman from DDR said correctly, uh, Schiller, in this situation, proves to be the real revolutionary. And you remember the famous a uh, sentence in the Ode to Joy, all men become Falcon. The opportunity that LaRouche forecast in his 1988 address had arrived, catching every major leader in the West and East completely by surprise. 
The moment had also arrived for the sane elements in the West to seize this opportunity and immediately offer their hand for Eastern debt relief, reconstruction and growth. Germany, which had been divided since the end of World War I, was now in a position where under the right leadership it could resume its position as a leading power in Europe and the world. A historic moment that had not existed since German unification under Chancellor Otto von Bismarck was the immediate political reality of the time. Okay, so we're going to go right now into our musical program. I think you all have a program in front of you, and if you don't, let me simply announce that we'll begin with Michelle Aaron, soprano, Margaret Greenspan at the piano, and then John Segerson, tenor, uh, with Margaret Greenspan and then I will introduce the rest of the program after. in English, Hope by Friedrich Schiller. All people discourse and dream on end of better days that are coming. After a golden and prosperous end, they are seen chasing and running. The world grows old and grows young in turn. But man for betterment hopes he turns. His hope delivers him into life. Round the frolicsome boy does it flutter. The youth is lured by its magic rife. It won't be interred by the elder. Though he ends in the coffin, his weary lope, yet upon that coffin he plants his hope. It is no empty fawning deceit begot in the brain of a jester. Proclaimed aloud in the heart is it. We are born for that which is better. And what the innermost vo voice conveys, the hoping spirit ne'er that betrays.
Far off in the misty distance lies my former happiness. My loving gaze now rests only on one single beautiful star. Yet, like the star's glory, it is but a phantom of the night. If you were o'ertaken by that long sleep, if death closed your eyes, my cares would yet possess you and you would live to my heart. But oh, you live in the light, yet you live not of my love. Can love's sweet yearning, Emma, can it pass away? And what's gone and passed, can that be love? Its flame's heavenly glow, does it, like an earthly thing, ever really die? Ist es nur ein Schein der Nacht? 
ist es nur ein Schein der Nacht. Dete ihr der lange Schlummer, dir der Tod die Augen zu. Ich besäße doch mein Kummer, meinem Herzen liebtest du. Now going to have two selections, which are neither of which is from Schiller. Uh, and the first will be Shakespeare, to whom Schiller is often compared. Certainly, he had a role, a very important role, in German drama. Uh, and this is going to be Luciana's monologue from the Comedy of Errors. And this is going to be done by Lea de Grucci, and then. Uh, John will be coming back to read to us from a biography of Johannes Kepler, Max Casper's biography on Kepler as a philosophical mind. So, yeah. And may it be that you have quite forgot a husband's office? Shall Antipholus, e'en in the spring of love, thy love springs rot? Shall love in building grow so ruinous? If you did wed my sister for her wealth, then for her wealth's sake use her with more kindness. Or if you like elsewhere, do it by stealth. Muffle your false love with some show of blindness. Let not my sister read it in your eye. Be not thy tongue, thy own shame's orator. Look sweet, speak fair, become disloyalty, apparel, vice like virtue's harbinger. Bear a fair presence, though your heart be painted. Teach sin the carriage of a holy saint. What need she be acquainted? What simple thief brags of his own attaint? Tis double wrong to truant with your bed, and let her read it in thy looks at board. Shame hath a bastard fame, well manage it. Ill deeds is doubled with an evil word. Alas, poor women, make us but believe, being compact of credit, that you love us, though others have the arm show us the sleeve. We in your motion turn, and you may move us. Then, gentle brother, get you in again. Comfort my sister, cheer her, call her wife. Tis holy sport to be a little vain when the sweet breath of flattery conquers strife. <laughs> Thank you. 
Another anniversary is coming up in a couple of years, which is the 450th anniversary of the birth of Johannes Kepler, the great founder of so many scientific fields, it's hard to number. He was a universal mind. He was, as Schiller described him, a philosophical mind, as opposed to the bread-fed scholar who simply shapes his opinions according to who pays him or her. I'm going to read from a section of a biography by Max Kaspar, who was a devoted follower of Kepler and who really we, we, should, we have a great tribute to him as well because in some of Germany's darkest hours in the middle of the, of the uh, Second World War, he devoted himself to working through the works of Kepler, translating many of them in beautiful German from the Lat its original Latin, uh, and explaining and, and bringing, bringing out his ideas, uh, which were based in many respects on the ideas of his great predecessor, Nicholas of Cusa, who lived in the century before. His greatest work was the world harmonies, the harmonies of the world. And indeed, this was his, Kepler's, Kepler's intense, lifelong dedication to the idea that the universe is not, and especially our role in it, is not a statistical anomaly. It's not just an accident. Of, but there is a reason for why we are here, and there's a reason for why everything works the way it does. And just as with Leibniz, he believed and insisted that we are in the best of all possible worlds because things happen for reasons, and that we have been given reason to discover those reasons. So um, in it, uh, he, uh, his major uh, crowning discovery was the discovery of what his so-called third law, where he, he began to put together and unify the idea of the solar system as an integrated system. Specifically, it was because he, was, he found a relationship, finally discovered this, a relationship between the periodicity of the, of the planets and their, uh, and their distances from the sun. That may seem some trivial, but it's it actually, if you don't have that idea of that, if it's just all accident in terms of where the orbits are and where the, what the speeds are, there's no coherence. He knew there was that coherence. Nobody had discovered it yet. He discovered it. This is a, a summation from his biography, Knox Kaspar's biography, uh, from, uh, of the world harmonies. And I just hope that it gives you uh, an impetus and encouragement to delve yourself into the works of Johannes Kepler, who is one of the great discoverers uh, of our civilization and of, the, and of humanity as a whole. We have intentionally rendered the contents of the world harmony with some completeness. Certainly for Kepler, this book was his mind's favorite child. Those were his thoughts to which he clung during the trials of his life and which distributed light to him in the darkness which surrounded him. He was writing, he was making these discoveries during the opening years of the Thirty Years' War. And, and in the middle of this, his mother had been accused of being a witch and was almost burned at the stake. They formed a place, his pl a place of refuge where he felt secure, which he recognized as his true home. However much we have said, of course, our arguments still give only a weak conception of the wealth of the contents, especially of the penetration with which the author pursues his successions of thoughts to the furthest roots and ramifications. He does not paddle around in his ideas. He drains them off. To become acquainted with the entire splendor of this unusual flower, it is necessary to take hold of the work itself. The contents are only very inadequately rendered by most of the biographies because their authors do not know them or cannot evaluate them. The third law is mentioned without an explanation of the context in which it appears in the book. That is to say, the pearl is taken out of its mounting 
where, however, its whole charm first becomes important. But the style of this mounting does not correspond to the materialism of our time. It is full of ornamentation, which is rich in references and, which who, and with whose symbolic loveliness many do not know how to begin anything. It is trivial to object to Kepler's conception on the grounds that there are not six planets only, then later times two or rather three additional planets outside Saturn's orbit and many hundreds of little ones between Mars and Jupiter have been discovered. As if every scientific system in which we frame the phenomena of nature did not correspond only to the position of research at, of the time and could not be overturned the very next day by the discovery of new experiential facts. Nevertheless, this is not the only question involved in the critique of the harmonice, harmonice mundi, harmonies of the worlds. Who asks what is true and what is false in Plato's Timaeus? So also, the measure of the positivists should not be used to, the, to value Kepler's book nor should an attempt be made to weigh its contents by the scale of the modern physicists, even if its weight is significant by such test also. In truth, if a work presents science with such a valuable contribution as the third planet law, not to mention the, ma the mathematical and musical fruits, then a critic must seek the lack in himself if he does not achieve an understanding of the manner of contemplating nature out of which the work has, origin, has arisen. This lack consists in the thinking being stuck fast in a rut of a one-sided contemplation of nature. It has been forgotten that that which is visible is a symbol of that which is invisible. Therefore, the poet, the artist, brings us closer to nature and can convey more and profounder and better things about it. Someone who once has been plunged in the cosmos of Platonic philosophy lives from this truth. That was the case with Kepler. Therein rests his conviction that, quote, all nature and all heavenly gracefulness is symbolized in geometry. Besides, Kepler understands the debt owed to the accuracy of scientific research and knows what he owes to experience. Quote, these speculations may not a priori offend well-known experience, but must be brought into agreement with it. But to establish matters of fact is never Kepler's final goal. He lives and works on another plane. With the accuracy of the researcher, who arranges and calculates observations, is united the power of shaping of an artist who knows about the image and the ardor of the seeker for God, who struggles with the angel. So his harmonice appears as a great cosmic vision woven out of science, poetry, philosophy, theology, mysticism, a vision risen from the depths of the human mind, seen as a radiation from the countenance of God, nourished from the supply of the senses, molded in the belief in ratio, inflamed by the inspiration of the prophet. It belongs to the most sublime which has been thought and devised by the human intellect, locked in the material world and desiring to lift itself out of it. It is a grandiose fugue on the, on the theme, world, soul, God, with a maestoso finale. By the thoughts on which it is fed, by the shapes according to which it is molded, it is the summa of the Renaissance. We're going to conclude the first half of our program with two selections. One, Schiller's poem, The Division of the World, Die Teilung der Erde, which will be done by Frank Mathis, and then uh, Schubert's Andi Musik, 
which will be done by Lisa Bryce Soprano and Richard Cordova Piano. German and then in English. Die Teilung der Erde. Nehmt hin die Welt, rief Zeus von seinen Höhen den Menschen zu. Nehmt, sie soll euer sein. Euch schenke ich sie zum Erb und ewigen Lehen, doch teilt euch brüderlich darein. Da etwas Hande hat sich einzurichten. Es regte sich geschäftig, jung und alt. Der Ackermann griff nach des Feldes Früchten, der Junker birchte durch den Wald. Der Kaufmann nimmt, was seine Speicher fassen. Der Abt wählt sich den edlen Firnwein. Der König sperrt die Brücke und die Straßen und sprach, der Zehnte ist mein. Ganz spät, nachdem die Teilung längst geschehen, nach der Poet. Er kam aus weiter Fern. Ach, da war überall nichts mehr zu sehen und alles hatte seinen Herrn. Weh mir! So soll denn ich allein von allen vergessen sein, ich, dein getreuester Sohn? So ließ er laut der Klage Ruf erschallen und warf sich hin vor Jovis Thron. Wenn du im Land der Träume dich verweilt, versetzt der Gott, so hadere nicht mit mir. Wo warst du denn, als man die Welt geteilt? Ich war, sprach der Poet, bei dir. Mein Auge hing an deinem Angesicht, an deines Himmels Harmonie mein Ohr. Verzeih dem Geiste, der von deinem Lichte berauscht, das Irdische verlor. Was tun, spricht Zeus, die Welt ist weggegeben. Der Herbst, die Jagd, der Markt ist nicht mehr mein. Willst du in meinem Himmel mit mir leben? So oft du kommst, er soll dir offen sein. The division of the world. Take thence the world, called Zeus from his high summit to all mankind. Take that which yours should be. As heritage eterne to you, I grant it. Divide it ye, yet brotherly. Then did all hands to preparation scurry, both young and old, industrious became. The farmer seized the produce from the country. The junker through the woods stalked game. The merchant in his stores had riches hoarded. The abbot chose the noble vintage wine. The king had all the roads and bridges boarded and claimed the tithe of all his mine. Quite late, just as the division was accomplished, the poet neared. He came from far away. Ugh, nothing more remains to be distinguished. A lord of everything had sway. Ah, woe is me! For why should I then solely forgotten be? I, thy most faithful son. Thus did he make his accusation loudly and threw himself for Jove's high throne. If thou to dwell in dreamland have decided, replied the god, then quarrel not with me. Where wert thou then? when I, the world, divided. I was, the poet said, by thee. My eyes did hang on thy expression, upon thy heaven's harmony my ear. Forgive the spirit which, by thy reflection enwrapped, did lose the earthly sphere. What can be done, said Zeus, for all is given, the crops, the hunt, the marts are no more free. Wouldst thou abide with me within my heaven? Whenever thou comest, t'will open be to thee.
Let's go.